Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Say Report. I'm your host, Devin Decker, and joining me, my host companion, Seijin Sarawick. Seijin? Hey, everybody. What's going on, man? Uh, well, I guess I need to apologize at the beginning for what my voice may sound like uh, right now at the beginning or by the end of the episode. Fucked up, Seijin. <laughs> Uh, what, what, what happened? What um, did I, you do? I fucked up in a brand new way, too, which is really nice. fun. Um, Excellent. <laughs> did you know that you can overdose on garlic? <laughs> I mean, you have to wait. How much garlic did you eat, my brother? <laughs> so, on Wednesday, I got two... You sit there with just a jar in your hand? What are you doing? No, no, no. I ate two... Uh, steak and cheese subs from Subway, foot long size, right? Uh, with their garlic aioli on it. Mm-hmm. And when I woke up the next morning, I like I felt fine. I didn't feel sick. I, I I'm not sick in any way, shape, or form. But my throat was like kind of bothering me, and I like coughed to see like oh maybe there's something stuck back there or something like that, and like blood kind of came out. Like not blood, but like. Blood was a little bit involved <laughs> in what ended up coming up out of my throat. I trigger warning, I guess, in, in case this stuff. So, so basically, you had such bad acid reflux that it. Uh... <laughs> well, you know, that's what I would have thought too. I would have thought that it was just really bad acid reflux. Turns mm-hmm. out, eating too much garlic can cause something called a vocal hemorrhage, mm. which is literally. Like bleeding in your vocal cords. <laughs> so, um, I've been dealing with that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not going to make jokes about this. Are you okay? <laughs> I mean, I think I'm okay. It's weird. It's a weird thing to be dealing with, to be certain. I appreciate you not making jokes about it. Uh, no, like it's, I was fine through most of Thursday, but like after the day at work, I got home and my voice started to get real froggy. Um, I've been treating myself with teas and honey, all the things that they say to do. Um, because I knew that we were recording today, but like, I don't know. I think that my voice sounds a little bit off right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. So just a heads no, up to everybody. For, okay. for the record, you sound okay. great. All right. So it's just all in my head after a yeah, weekend I, of. I wouldn't have known there was anything wrong. If yeah. You, well, yeah. Well, I wanted to, anything. but I wanted to warn people like garlic aioli. Don't have two sandwiches covered in garlic aioli. You could have a bad time. Because, <laughs> like, yeah, the, the acid reflux thing that you said, that would make sense. But I, you need to understand, like, there's usually pain from the stomach up the esophagus with that, right? Like, uh-huh. heartburn tends to follow a specific path. <laughs> Literally, the only pain I feel is in my... um voice box which has a name and I was going to larynx it's in my larynx area so yeah <laughs> <laughs> that was a fun new thing I learned don't eat too much garlic and then like the weird thing about it is I have so associated garlic with pizza and like tomato sauce that like that first like eruption <laughs> of sputum from my larynx area, just the mm-hmm. worst terminology. Apologies. Um, tasted like it tasted like garlic, but I'm like, when the fuck did I eat tomatoes? Because <laughs> I hadn't had any tomatoes. I don't know. It's don't, it's scary, don't but know what, I, don't know <laughs> I don't know. It's, All I can think of is that episode of the Simpsons with the with the. With the razor crustio, <laughs> jagged metal crustio. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, I, I like yeah. that one. <laughs> so, I, I, well, does that mean that you weren't able to do any of your homework for this week? Oh no, what? I did. I got was able to complete all my homework. Don't worry about that. But I mean, <sighs> so maybe we talk about those instead of your bloody throat. That sounds like a good plan, right? But I, 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 I just wanted to make sure if anyone out there thought that I sounded off that I was. Fully transparent about that. Like, really just using the fact that we're still releasing a podcast this week um, as as best I can. (laughs) 
Uh, I mean, before we get to the homework, because uh, I think that there's a lot there to dive into, I'm really excited. Um, it was weird that you assigned me a task on YouTube, considering the week that YouTube has had. Right? Like, sure? I, like, I don't want to... What happened on YouTube this week? I actually wasn't aware that we having a week. Oh, you, yeah, well, YouTube is fine, but a very popular tech channel on YouTube... Oh, yes. Okay. They like, kind of <laughs> shit his pants. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. So this isn't a YouTube problem. Yeah, so no. Linus Tech Tips kind of went tits up this week. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's just, like Everybody's probably already heard about it, but it was impossible to be on YouTube and like not be over-inundated by it. Like, Honestly, even... it was hard to be on any type of social media and not be inundated by it. I mean, Reddit was covered in shit this week. Um, the X, formerly known as Twitter, was 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 covered in a bunch of stuff about it, um, because there was there was just stuff popping off everywhere in terms of um, people coming out of the woodwork to talk about kind of like their experiences at the company and and all of the stuff that's been going down in terms of the products that have been sent to the company. And yeah, I I, I don't know. I, I, have we ever talked about Linus Tech Tips on here? I I don't know if we ever have because it's like. It's not a channel that either of us follow, right? To my knowledge, you are not somebody that follows Linus Tech. I certainly don't subscribe, um, but they are kind of perfect background noise, is what I will say about Linus Tech Tips, is if I'm working on something and I just don't want it to be quiet in the room, I can throw that on, and it is super easy to... Like tune out, but so like we'll not be alone. On, though, right? What? Like this is not just like a guy on a making videos. This yeah. is an entire network of of. So it, we're in that era of YouTube, right? Where where people are creating full on companies that are pumping out various types of of series and episodes on a regular basis. Um, it is it is one way people are using YouTube, right? Is is by going this route of creating these larger corporations that that do this sort of thing, and um, I am so, like I, I I have such little connection to this stuff that like I didn't realize when everybody kept talking about Linus Tech Tips having these issues and stuff, I thought it was still just this one dude. I thought it was still just this guy because like the, the meme dude, like I had no idea that he had been operating at this level of having various like people underneath him making numbers of videos a day, um, social media posts and things like that. I, I did not know how big this guy was. Um, you say that you put the videos on in the background. Like, what are the videos even like? I literally thought, again, it was just a guy doing, like, unboxing videos in front yeah. of his camera. So the big thing is we talk about Linus Tech Tips. You say Linus Tech Tips, but the bigger, like, problem is actually with the corporation, which is Linus Media Group, which is seven or eight channels total that all are, like, under the, the umbrella of Linus Media Group, Linus Tech Tips being just one of them. And then they have like Tech Linked, Tech Quickie, uh, uh, they do um, like Game Linked. They have like a bunch of different things so that like Linus Tech Tips is the primary channel where it's usually Linus Sebastian, who was the former CEO of the company. Um, he's now calling himself the Chief Visionary, o Chief Vision Officer, the CVO. But he's also still the owner of the company. He just, a, a guy he used to work with who has gone on and worked in the tech industry uh, for companies like Dell and and, and others, Taryn Tong, uh, was appointed as CEO approximately two months ago. And then that just went into effect at the start of August. And like, I've joked about this stuff because, I mean, I put them on in the background and they're kind of like reviews. And I say kind of like reviews because of everything that we know now. And also, a lot of the time, it's, I just use it as a way to look at a product I may have interest in. I really don't give any credence to what they have to say about the product. But if I want to oh, see somebody nice. who like has a similar amount of intelligence about a product put hands on a product not just like an unboxing where like this is what's in the box but like i'm going to use this and and an example that i can use is uh for gaming headsets i really like HyperX's stuff i've been using the HyperX cloud 2 forever eventually got to the cloud alpha and they just released the cloud 3 and i watched mm -hmm. their video on it 
and was interested, like, oh, there's some some issues that I had with it seem to have been addressed. Um, I'm probably going to try one out. But then at the end of their video, they're like, these are not good. These are awful headphone headset. Like, it's not a big enough upgrade from the two. Now, to me, looking at it and as someone who used the two forever, I'm like, no, there were significant upgrades that, like, were needed to make the headset continually relevant in the mm-hmm. gaming space. Considering I've been using my HyperX since I got my PS4, like there, there's time to grow with these things, you right. know, Seijin. But there's a so with the, with like review and and product based like YouTube, there's a sliding scale of how much of it is just marketing for the product and how much of it is actually somebody out there trying to give legitimate reviews and and you and you never can be no 100%. Like, I think that's one of the first things that we need to admit, right? Is like, you can never know 100% where money is coming from, how products are getting into people's hands, all of that. And there's been a lot of talk over the last few years about ways that that should be handled, right? Like, there's been the conversations about influencers being extremely clear, hashtag ad, right? Like, that, like, there's, there, this is not a new conversation, right? And it has basically come to light with a lot of these videos, like, as you've been talking about, that you really probably shouldn't trust the review angle of some of the stuff coming out of the Linus Media Group because it turns out that more often than not, they were receiving a lot of incentives to maybe be a little bit more biased towards their stuff. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, the fact that they, like, work with AMD and then they review AMD product, that's crazy. And they did that with Intel, too. Like, they do these tech makeover uh, but videos. The it, it, but there's tons of stuff where guys will get will, will get their hands on stuff by doing consulting work for companies and stuff like that, right? And, and there's all sorts of guys out there that have their hands in these companies, too. If they're clear about that, if they're honest, if they're, if they're saying, like, and they're explaining their connection to the product before they review it, and you're going in with that information, then I don't think it's that crazy. I think that's how a lot of this industry like works right um it's funny that we're talking about this because one of the big things that i asked you to review uh, one of the one of the the channel i asked you to take a look at this week is uh this guy that it it latches on to things like how it's made and unwrapped and stuff like that which are notoriously just marketing for these for these products that they're showing right and if you watch enough of his videos you start to hear kind of a pattern of him calling that out in a lot of his stuff it's like this idea that like they're not telling you this but this is basically a giant ad right because this is not new to just youtube either is what i'm getting at oh yeah this is something that 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 has always been kind of in the water with this sort of stuff whenever a product shows up on a screen in front of you you've got to question how that product got there and with youtube um um, being so far reaching, you know, it's availability to kids, it's availability to the kind of, you know, the the more vulnerable parts of our society, like we've gotten kind of squishy, like we, we, we feel kind of like you need to be a little bit clearer about this shit. And finding that that trust has been broken is definitely a larger part of this like whole like reveal. Um, but also some of the behind the scenes stuff of like, workplace harassment and stuff cannot we cannot deny that that's like (laughs) as bad as you so the whole thing starts because in a lab tour right because they they linus media group said that the future of their channel and everything they were doing they were going to build a lab where they could run independent tests on a whole bunch of tech and products and then they had a big convention and as part of that convention a bunch of creators got to tour that lab space And one of the employees, when he was talking about why our testing is different from other YouTube channels, name dropped two YouTube channels. And honestly, that right there, that's the shot heard around the world of this current controversy. Not to like belittle the Revolutionary War. So when you say Huge you named two YouTube channels, do you mean two rival ones or two of theirs? What, what do you mean? Two two YouTube channels that also existed in the tech space. I mean, I guess rival is such a weird thing. They also did reviews of tech. I mean, was he calling products. them out and calling them shit, or was he calling them out and saying we're working with them? What was he saying? I don't so know what? He, so okay. Them. So what he says is that the difference between our reviews and something like these two i I don't want to throw shade or anything like that right i want to focus on that you wouldn't be we'd be that's true (laughs) i can't remember well i yeah so gamer nexus and then i don't remember the other one review unboxed 
Um, okay. I think might be the name of it. I don't know that one a hundred percent. That's the other reason why I wanted to make sure if you want to get the actual name Seijin, because the first thing is that, um, I think it's review on box. Uh, they responded on Twitter. Like that. I don't know why you got to do that. Like put that in the video, say that to a bunch of these tech creators, like our tests are better because we're running new tests on all the product. Every time we get it, unlike these guys, like, it just seemed like a weird... It was punching down. We talk a lot about this show about, like, not punching down. Linus Media Group, earlier this year, this was disclosed by Linus Sebastian, um, was valued at $100 million. <laughs> Somebody offered him $100 million. That's one followed by eight zeros to buy the company from him. So that is an inf- that's a number that we know this organization was worth just this year, right? These mm-hmm. other channels that are not corporations that not do have not have staffs like over a hundred people, they're not really in the same space as what Linus Tech Tips is doing. So for them to like call out the way we're different is because we got all this money. We can run tests every time there's new product. Like, it really feels like punching down, right? Am I wrong on that? Well, it's, it's, it it calls attention to the ways in which, again, we are so kind of divorced from what's going on behind the scene. When I say we, like the audience for YouTube is divorced from what's going on behind the scenes sometimes, because you'd be forgiven for assuming that they were on the same level as something like a gamer's nexus. Because if you look at the product that they're putting out, if you're looking at their output, there is similar output between the two, but it isn't until you really start to understand what's going on behind the scenes that you see things like, oh, like gamer's nexus is putting out like a video a day whereas like the linus media group is putting out like seven right and then on top of that like the social media presence and then you realize because we find out about some of the 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 practices behind the scenes that the reason that there, there seems to be a larger social media presence for some for something like the the lmg right is because they actually have requirements for their for their guys to be on once twice a day right to to actually be posting shit yeah. And so, and then you look at things like like Reddit, and you're like, oh yeah, because the Reddit is much more active and things like. So we don't we don't think about the web of uh, of like information that is being kind of woven by these companies. And if once you look at it that way, Linus Media Group definitely has something more going on than something like a gamer's nexus. Where so so the problem is that like if you're approaching it solely from I watch YouTube videos you definitely would be forgiven for assuming those two are the same and what you're what you're talking about here is somebody like linus like falling into that exact trap as somebody that should fucking know better because he's on the other side of the line and you hear this shit a lot in these in these situations where just because they're also only just looking at something like video output or things like that or or watch numbers and things like that they're 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 lumping themselves in with a company that they shouldn't so Yes, you are correct indeed that it is punching down at a company that is just not operating at the same level as him and and everybody there, right? Like, that is just so far beyond. But it, it's indicative also of kind of their attitude about the whole fucking thing is is their, their mindset, literally what they refer to as their grind set, is this whole product output number stuff. And so all they're looking at is how many videos are we posting? How many people are watching those videos? How many people are commenting on those videos? How often are those videos getting shared around and, and moved, you know, in, in other places besides YouTube? How often are they being posted to X and things like that? So, like, when you're only looking at those numbers, everybody's playing that game. And the problem is, is that if you're going to operate a company, the ways in which they want to operate this this new company, this line is media group with this large lab to input and, and bringing on like new hires and, and bringing on new channels and new talent, like you cannot keep working that way. And that is actually really interesting relating back to some other stuff that happened just this very year if you look at some stuff with the Try Guys and the ways in which they pulled some moves and operated not as YouTubers, but instead as an actual business. And when they had to let somebody go from the top because of business-related sexual harassment, like, like not lawsuits, I don't know if it ever got that far, but there were definitely complaints and, and things like that like put out there. As a business, they cut ties with a person that was responsible for that stuff. And then everybody out there who only looks at them again as YouTube output gave them a bunch of shit because they were just like, these five guys making prank videos on the internet fired a guy. because And it's like, we, that's not... 
they, they, they recognize that as a business that has employees, that has contracts, that has a responsibility to keep people safe, they had to behave in a certain way. That makes total sense. Of course, if you're just looking at it as five guys making videos in their mom's backyard, it starts to get really weird. But that's not what they are, right? And it's the same thing here, is that, like, we are... We are talking about when you look at two channels like Gamers Nexus versus the Linus Tech Tip stuff, you're talking about two different worlds of YouTube creators. And the problem is right now we have no way to to we have no vocab for that. We have no way to, to talk about that, to look at these two as two different things. Yeah. The weird thing about where Linus Media Group stands in the like corporate world is that it kind of has a foot in both like the larger corporations that we have issues with or, or that you hear problems with how they're running the company. They're like laying people off, even though they're seeing record profits, all of that stuff. And then they also have that foot still in like, oh, but we're like this little group of friends who are making YouTube videos. Right. And because they live in both worlds, we're getting kind of exposure to the nastier side of corporations mm -hmm. because of how they they've had to manage themselves with this growth, with this valuation yeah, it, it, of a hundred million dollars. Like that's the craziest thing to me is that you, like, you, for, you're, you're, you're ignoring that that's not even the biggest company this year in this realm that, that got that. I mean, yeah. look at what everything that happened with Smosh this year. And the, the fact that like Smosh is, is back because after years of a bunch of corporate bullshit behind the scenes of, of ownership of the country and contracts and, and style and all of that stuff bouncing around, it ended up with the good Mythical Morning guys for a while. And Rhett and Link, who have been kind of mentoring and overseeing Smosh kind of back to greatness, kind of just handed the keys back over to um to to the smosh guys this just this very year and they they were able to get adam back and everything like there's this the 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 years like the era of corporate youtube is here right like yeah. you've got huge companies that are actually behind the scenes here and it's not huge companies that bought their way into youtube i'm talking about huge companies that have been grown at, out of the soil that is YouTube into these other companies. Because I mean, like you've also, you've got huge gamer groups with like Jaden animations and like her whole like mansion that she's running that people are like kind of moving in and out of on a regular basis to like do a bunch of video game stuff. And that's something we've talked about before that <laughs> whole model of like the YouTube house model. Those kind of are where these corporation models kind of got born out of because everybody was suddenly moving, living together and they were all basically working contracts together and, and signing contracts with another to keep all their shit together you had people rise to the top and become kind of these leaders ceos of these companies and now we see this where like depending on the kind of channel that they are right like they're going out and buying up resources to make their channel better um you have you know you have the try guys that work this way you have smosh that works this way you have linus media group that works this way you have um who are the guys that like do the near impossible stuff where they like they they're dude perfect right where yeah. they're able to like like throw a paper airplane 600 feet and get them into like a flaming ring and shit like that like those guys also have a multi-million dollar corporation and so the the reason why the hundred million dollars um hits really weird with with Linus media group in particular is that in both the like corporate side of things and the and and you know the entertainment the entertainment marketing side of things that's an unheard of number in those realms Right to have a company yeah. that is that is reviewing material that is also valued at a hundred million dollars itself is is crazy in those realms, not in YouTube realms though. If you're looking at it specifically as YouTube creators, he's kind of on the lower end of guys in this position, oh, yeah. like Mr. Beast and what he is worth or anything else like that. Yeah, so it's you're not well, wrong. You believe that Mr. Beast has a whole corporation behind him as well, right? Yeah, exactly. Like that's, one yeah. Of the, that's one of those. That's a, a perfect example of something that we have to remember. Because I mean, look at everything going on with Mr. Beast and Mr. Beast Burger right now, and the fact that he's like suing his own. Like everybody's everybody talks about him suing himself, and he's not suing himself. He's suing the company that they hired to become Mr. Beast Burger because they haven't been able to maintain consistent value in the food across all markets, right? And and honestly, I think. 
he's got a pretty good case considering some of the reviews that have come out of, of Mr. Beast Burger in certain areas versus reviews in others. Like some some areas gave it like 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 top notch five star ratings and it was like knocking other burger places like out, off of off of DoorDash. And then there's some places where the food was so bad people were calling it like unsafe. And like if that's what's going on, he has every right, I think, as a, as a company man to step in and be like, what the fuck is happening? But that's a whole different conversation. But in that idea, people are are caught up in this idea that Mr. Beast is suing Mr. Beast Burger, trying to figure out like how he's like suing himself, trying to like get away with something. And it's like, no, that's not what's happening, guys. You have to understand that Mr. Beast as an entity is a huge company behind him. And there is a and there is a company that they acquired that is not doing what they're supposed to do and so they are suing them for to, to get that settled that happens all the time in the business world but in the youtube world we just don't understand it because we that's just not something that we are used to or the way that we look at this this kind of realm of entertainment right but to get back to it yeah so those first shots were fired um uh review unbox I, again i don't know if that's the name of it i would like to look that up um, so I know that the the company that they kind of screwed was Billet Labs. Is that yeah, no, at? Billet Labs is not. We're not even at the Billet Labs of it all right now. Because what what I'm trying to talk about is why Gamer Nexus does a 40 minute video talking about the ethnic like ethic the ethic ways the ethic. Sorry about that. The ethics of the reviews at Linus Tech Tips and Linus Media Group. And how that should be like examined, and also the fact Why that would you take a swing at a at a nerd on the internet. If you if, like, you better come out freaking prepared in that regard. Of course, you ended up with like hours long videos breaking your shit down. Yeah, like it's and that's that's the thing about it is that I feel like that guy in the original labs video. First of all, I don't even know if he knows that he was being filmed at the time that he said it. Cause it's not like it was a Linus tech tips video. It was a video from one of the creators who was on the tour. So like, I don't even yeah. know where, if he knew that he was being watched, but he clearly was not on any sort of script. And it was just one of those things where like compared to these other two YouTube reviewers, this is why we're different. And then what he said about why they were different, that they're running tests and that their tests are so great. You know, Steve over at Gamers Nexus looks into it and finds a lot of times where the review data is wrong. And rather than repair it or test it again, they just published that bad information. And then if they found out it was wrong, they would amend it with, you know, like an asterisk and a note written on screen. But like I said, I put it on in the background. So if I'm not watching the video, I'm not going to see that correction. Yeah, but footnote and post-edit corrections is not unusual. It's just, it's one of those things where I don't actually have an issue with with that, right? And it, it's... So Steve Burke over at, at Gamer Nexus does a really good breakdown of this. This is not me, like, arguing with his, with his like, reviewer or, or criticism. I think he does a really good job of laying out why it's a problem specifically related to to what we now know about the finances. Again, if he had been, if, if, if videos had been much more clear about where products were coming from or where the finances for the video were coming from, then this is just par for the course stuff with YouTube. Right. I mean, I would rather, let me put it this way, I would rather that there be a footnote on the video than none. That, oh, that's true. I think where, the, where one of the problems that like it, it stuck with me is strange is that because Linus... Uh, Tech Tips is such a large channel and such an old school, like grandfathered in YouTube channel. They're able to repost videos under the same title. Like they could change the video file that is associated with the, the, the upload on YouTube URL. Does it, the, you understand what I'm saying? I'm, I want to make sure that I, that I mean, like that's that's not entirely true. The way that the way that YouTube posting works, it would still metrics wise not be the same video. Like they can they can put it under the same link for sure, so that people can get to it. But in terms of the YouTube metrics, which again is the thing that they care about, they're going to lose those viewership numbers. They're going to lose all of that sort of See, shit. But that like but that's that, based on that, what that is part of the reason why that is the part of the reason why these kinds of in in video edits and things like that happen and 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 work is that there is. 
it is a it is a pros and cons kind of math between re-uploading a video or putting a correction onto an already existing video. There are pros and cons to both. One of the cons to re-uploading a video is that there are numbers that you lose if you do that. Well, I mean that, but the way that that Steve talked about it in his video, it seems like they don't have those cons. That it will well, still show hundred million dollar company. That's, right, that's, that's the reason they don't. But it doesn't like reset their view number if they put up a new video. It doesn't delete all the comments based on the original video. No, but it fucks their numbers in terms of what point do people watch the most of, and like, and and okay, so yeah, I get that. That makes sense. Yeah, other metrics saying. Yeah. Right. When you're changing the length of the video and things like that, like there there are numbers that get fucked with that become useless because you've real up uploaded a video. And if you're using those numbers to sell yourself to advertisers, to push yourself in the YouTube algorithm in any way, like because people are out there gaming it. And if you know that and if you have in your head what you think the algorithm is going to do for you and how that works, and then so you start tinkering around with your videos after they've been uploaded, like things get fucked. But no, people people change like this happens all the time in, in, um, in video game uh like it's let's, let's play videos people oh, will change um people will change the uh the thumbnail and the name of videos all the time to try and push like stuff uh to the front like like it, it's kind of a problem like they figured out that if they uploaded a video i, I just i'm just going to call it all gamer youtubes in, in general right now because they all kind of do this in some way but if they upload a video and it's either not doing well or hit really big but now it's starting to wane off a little bit if you just change the thumbnail that is sometimes enough just to get yourself back up to the top 10 if you change the title on it that's sometimes enough just to get people because you end up with clicks from people that have already even watched it and stuff like that and then even if they start it and they go oh i already watched this video and turn it off it doesn't matter you've already got that first click in that already kind of pu pushes those initial numbers and stuff right so like changing stuff on videos is something that happens a lot right and as you've pointed out corrections and stuff people that are putting up videos that have like a little bit more of a tag at the end to kind of clarify an issue or or videos that have links in them that that link to other videos to clarify and things like that that kind of stuff happens all the time it's just again it's a pros and a cons because like more often than not for these little companies that that are putting out these videos and they are small companies even even singular creators kind of have to this world in order to survive on youtube have to put a little bit of a of work into making their own like company style like setup right like if it when they start doing that math they have to weigh out is it worth those small hits in order to get my video seen and more often than not for them it can be then it's just a matter of is it worth my time and that's that's a whole other conversation is like the act of like redoing a video re-uploading all of that shit that takes time and if you're somebody that needs to be posting you know i, I think at some point um i'm thinking of like the the video game youtuber jack septicai i think at some point in his career he was doing like two videos a day and so if he had a video go up and he said something incorrect like it just wasn't worth his it wasn't worth his time to go back and fix that video. What he would do is he would issue a correction in a later thing, or he would make fun of himself later. Once he ended up with a, with an editor, I don't know if he's still if he's editing his own stuff or not. But once his stuff started to become more edited, like adding in like edited corrections that were more often than not calling his shit out, right? Because that's the other thing is how are these in video corrections being being displayed? For somebody like Linus Tech Tips, it's probably just a note on screen that just says, hey, I said this thing wrong, here's what it really is. Whereas like guys like, say, Matt Pat, who are out there doing game theory videos, if he calls out a character by the wrong name, like the video will often just straight up come to a stop for a second for his for his editor to come in and, and like reprimand him. <laughs> Like, and which is a much more effective correction, I think, right? Like, like the, the style of which YouTube misinformation, right, gets out there is, again, it's a sliding scale, right? So you, and you have to kind of determine how a, vi a certain creator handles that stuff, if that's going to work for you. And, and a lot of what was going on with the Linus Tech Tips stuff is kind of par for the course across the board for all types of DIY YouTube and, and informational YouTube and and and, um, and and entertainment YouTube. Going in and making these types of corrections and doing this is fine. The problem becomes that you don't get to say that and then start taking pot shots at people for having the, the best setup for testing. You don't get to make the same mistakes everybody else is making and then put yourself on a freaking pedestal and say how much better you are than everybody. And which yeah. is which is what we're really getting at here is like Steve Burke over at at, at Gamers Nexus is wouldn't have made the I, like I, there's no way that he would have made this video this harshly if 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 they had not been called out right and so like 
in that, I think that we have to recognize that, like, everybody's making these mistakes, but what Linus Tech Tips did is they fucking put themselves up, and they made themselves a target when they when they acted like this. Yeah. Uh, Hardware Unboxed is the other one, the one that I've been trying to think of the name of. Um, so it was Gamers Nexus and Hardware Unboxed that were called out in that original. Hardware Unboxed responded with some stuff on Twitter. Um, so then it got addressed again on their weekly podcast, The Wand Show. And then that was when they wouldn't like name the companies, but they addressed the controversy that that's when Gamer Nexus is like, well, I'm going to look into it now because this is ridiculous. And he finds all of this proof. And I think I think where Steve also took um, umbrage with the way that they're handling it is that if you know that it's misinformation at the time of editing and you're a company that employs like a hundred plus people. Why don't you take the time to say we misspoke here? Like you're at the editing point. It's not posted yet when you find out that what you have is incorrect. I think, I think again, that's a kind of a misunderstanding of how this all this stuff works. Because I, I'm just saying what his issue people. was. That, that that's I know, and I'm yeah. pointing out why he was incorrect in this moment. Yeah. Because because when you talk about that, what you're what you're not recognizing there is it's not a company of a hundred people coming into an office all day and working on one thing together. You have seven disparate companies with these seven channels under Linus Tech, uh, under Linus Media Group, and so you already divide that by seven. Then within that, those groups are responsible for multiple videos, perhaps a day, at least uh, a week, and so you have teams within there that are not working on the same video. Then within that, you have your talent, which are the ones that are doing a thing, versus when it's edited, which could be days later. Your talent could already have a schedule together of videos they're already working on, so you don't have time to go back and refilm a thing because they're already three videos ahead of where you are like the ways in which these companies pump out these videos maybe that is something that should be called out and talked about but if his question is why aren't you just refilming shit well because that nobody nobody got time for that when an edited footnote is perfectly fine and like if footnotes work in books like like they, 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 they should work on videos YouTube, for, yeah. for years like, they, like there's 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 a level of correction being made that at some point has to be covered. And if you're, if your excuse for that not working is because you're not actually watching a video while it's on, then you don't like, that's, that's, that's your true. You're, you're you're going against it. Yeah, like... right, right, right. By saying I'm not looking at the screen while I play a video, they should be doing more than just putting words on the screen. It's like, well, then maybe you should be choosing to take in this information in a way that is not the way that they intended it to be taken in. Like right, they intended right, it to right. be watched. Right. So like I, I appreciate the idea that but 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 I think it goes back to what I was saying is that if you were going to tout yourself as a hundred million dollar company with hundreds of people working for you and then you're going to make the same mistakes other people are making, you, you can't do that. You, you got to pick one. You don't get to be an asshole throwing your weight around about how big and bad you are. Because then exactly this, you get guys that you call out coming at you and being like, <laughs> you're no better than the rest of us, which I think is more of the point that, that Burke is trying to make with the Gamers Nexus stuff is, is he makes this video doing this takedown of all of this shit, but all of it is coming from a place of you just, you dared to, to put yourself above the rest of us. And he basically is pointing out how th what's going on there is still no better than anywhere else on YouTube. He's not Linus and Linus Tech Tips and Linus Game, uh, Media Group and all that shit. Like they're not they're not doing anything that is bettering the the art of YouTube, and the ways in which they tried to act like they were is basically their big their their big downfall. Their hubris is really the issue here. Right, because we still wouldn't be talking about it. We certainly wouldn't be talking to it almost a week later on our show if. Linus on the forums hadn't responded to that video very emotionally to the point where like, well, now your response belies another issue with what's going on with this whole thing. Right. That like kind of, it sort of almost proves the point of like, see, you're not better than the rest of YouTube the way that you acted in that moment. So mm -hmm. then that gets a response and then it gets picked up further. And then from Linus Media Group, the fact that we're going to take a week off of videos. And, like, honestly, I don't know if that fixes the problem. It's been stated they were releasing 25 videos a week across their various channels. 
Um, and there's a video that they posted like four months ago where everybody was asked, you know, is Linus a bad boss? And this kind of like undercover boss, but the the boss is not there. It's just that he's not involved with this video. We want honest opinions from you. And the consensus was we're running at too fast a pace. It is a quantity over quality. It'd be nice to take a breath and watch this stuff to make sure if it's correct. So like. This was a known issue there. And like that kind of came out prior to I'm going to be stepping down as CEO. So I think that video and that like completely raw look at how people working at the company felt about the production schedule was probably one of those things that like I know how to make videos and I know how to like I have vision for what this channel should be. I don't necessarily know how to run a corporation. Well, and, and also from a creator standpoint, right, coming at it from the YouTube angle of it, he is a guy that was able to pump out a certain amount of work. And he rose to the top because he was able to pump out a lot of good quality work. Like, 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 and and I think there's this problem that a lot of guys find themselves in when they're when they're in this position to move into the 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 kind of the head of the company role, whether that is just a smaller group of five or six gamers that they're just kind of in charge of and, and managing, or if they're rolling into a company position where they've got this corporation behind them. Like, there's there's this inability to recognize that what they were doing was special which is which sucks because like he he then basically was expecting from all of his employees the same level of dedication and output and and quality that he was able to put in when it was just him and it's like but the reason that you were able to get as good as you were the reason that you rose to the top is because you were unique in that regard but the, but the inability to like recognize that sucks right because like i i think that that's part of the give and take with when you want to get into one of these bigger companies is you need to then you need to acknowledge that like that the work that's going to go out there is maybe not going to be the same kind of work you were doing when you were a smaller channel and that happens a lot with some of these groups i mean like the 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 types of videos that came out that come out of groups now like I mean, you look at something like I think about like the outside Xbox guys over in England and how they do so much more than just outside Xbox. Now they they've um, they and they do they do other video game stuff. They've got D and D stuff that they do. They've got some film stuff that they've dipped their hands into, right? And like this like this idea that they've kind of really pushed the amount of stuff that they've put out, but they've pushed the type of stuff that they've put out to, to new to new heights but they've really never pushed how much they put out they still only put out a, a video every day and that video now is on rotation between different teams for, do, on what they are so like they're not putting out more stuff per week just because they're doing more stuff and that's great that's awesome because it means that we're not watching burnout um you know you could argue whether or not stuff is getting redundant because they're a youtube channel that's been running for almost a decade but like that's a that's a different conversation like than than saying that that you're pushing your people you're burning your your workers out right um but i think that is definitely the more important conversation here is that like the quality of what he's putting out and the quantity that he is demanding from his team is in the fucking tank tank it's like it's it's just been in the shitter for for a while and i think that people have kind of felt that and it's been kind of coasting on a lot of just like past like love for the channel because again this is coming from somebody that was never deeply invested in this guy or his channels in any regard i just know the guy from a couple of like memes like other than that like i never watched any of his stuff and and to hear that it blew up this fast and then fumbled this fast says to me that this is a person that just didn't know how to grow i mean right? blew up that fast it's weird they've been around for 10 years so like it's just they were offered someone offered to buy them this year. Linus which Media is where, Group has been around for ten years, or Linus Tech. Linus Tips Tech Tips, but then the media group itself has been around for at least three years. Like it's it's not this isn't like overnight success. They've been around for a while. The three, big three shift years is a pretty short amount of time to have eight hundred million dollars. Right, but I just want to I just want to make sure that is in in the world of tech that is pretty pretty quick. I understand that, but I want to make sure that people understand it's not an overnight success, if that makes sense. I mean, but it kind I mean, of is, which is what makes it such a big deal. That's what I'm saying. Okay, well, Linus Media Group was founded October 3rd, 2012. So they've been around for 10 years. Okay. So it's like... That's different than three. Yeah. That is, 
Yeah, privately held Canadian entertainment company founded by Linus Sebastian and Yvonne Ho in 2012. So, okay. yeah, it's not like they didn't just like show up overnight to be this thing. They've been steadily growing, which is another thing with it. Like that steady growth and then to ha- hit a wall like this, because then the last thing is as they put it, put out their apology video, we're going to take a break thing. Um, allegations were released uh, from a former employee about sexual misconduct and just like workplace harassment in terms of like bullying and things like that. And honestly, that kind of felt like the final nail. And the, the people who are questioning why come out now, like I, I hate that part of it. Like I come out now because like maybe I feel safe enough to come out now because now everybody is like kind of upset about it. I think about the fact that like right now, Disney, right? The, the, the company Disney, like they're not doing great. There are rumors about them maybe selling all sorts of things like that. But a couple of years ago, if you were to speak ill about the company of Disney, you would be subject to all sorts of ridicule for like daring to question that company and their choices. Where now, like Forbes is like, what has Disney been doing? (laughs) It's, I don't know. Like there's a time where you feel safer to maybe say these things. And as the company, when you're talking about, especially when we're talking about like online like entertainment, like YouTube and social media and stuff like that. Like in, in, because in that regard, it's so intertwined with your day to day life. It's not just like, like coming out against your, your company and like, Oh, you'll never work in this industry ever again. Like that's definitely part of it. But then add to that, that you also will never get a moment's rest in your, in your personal life as well. Right. Like, yeah. Coming out against Disney, like, yeah, you might get slapped on the wrist because, depending on the way that you do it by the company, but nobody nobody in, in your day to day life is going to give you shit for coming True. out. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. And then, but it is, it's one of those situations where, like, she came out, Madison Reeve is her name. She came out, she said all this stuff. And then other people have come out to say, you know, like, I've witnessed that or this, these, these moments that she mentioned where it wasn't until like, yeah, I saw that happen. And the craziest thing about it is like, these allegations are not the type of company that we want Linus Media Group to be. Well, no shit. Nobody wants their company to be like, oh, we're a den of sexual harassers. Yeah. No. Right. Like this doesn't represent our vision for the company. Well, I certainly hope not. Like what a yeah. what a weird thing to say, I, I I just don't know. So like that thing felt like the final nail. I don't know what's gonna happen once their week off from producing videos comes along. I'm sure there'll be another talking head video where and even that talking head video like by joking about sponsorships and also like introducing new product that possibly might be sold in their online marketplace. Like, there's a time and a place for that, and it that doesn't seem like the time or place to be glib. Yeah, no, like, <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, there's, there wasn't so much about, about all of that. I mean, the, the joking about advertisements, they straight up had it monetized for, like, a hot second. Not only did now, they have like, it monetized, like, the other thing about Linus Media Group is that they have their own YouTube called Floatplane, and it's a subscriber service where you can see videos that other people post up, right? And one of the bonuses of going to their own YouTube site is you have first access to their videos. That apology Mm. video was up for like two hours on their own site before it went live on YouTube. So like not only did they monetize on YouTube, they also weirdly paywalled an apology briefly. I mean, like, it, the, that comes back, though, again, to, like, we need to understand what's going on behind the scenes there. Because because they are not involved at YouTube, they are subject to the same, like, like types of barriers that any other creator on YouTube is. So, literally, things like a video needing to be, like, posted, and then it takes a, a, a certain amount of time for it to actually show up on the site. Like, that's not anything to do with them. That's YouTube. And the same with monetization. Is monetization is actually decided automatically. Like, it is it is, it is, is just assigned by, by the AI behind whatever they decide. Is at a certain point, your video's gotten this certain number of views, we can do this with it, you get this monetization 
information that just gets automatically applied they had to go out of their way to reach out to youtube to ask them to pull the advertising off of the video right and like but but to kind of what i think stephen burke's point would probably be on this regard you should know that that's how this works you should be aware that that's what's going to happen with YouTube and with the algorithm and all of that. So what you do is you try and post to YouTube first, and then as soon as you see that the video is up, then you post it to Float as well. Or if you know that monetization may be an issue, you reach out to your YouTube rep before you before that happens and say, "Hey, we're posting a video and we don't want it to get monet." Like you should be aware that that's what's going to happen with the platform, and you should be using your insider knowledge to be a better YouTube. This is what I was getting at, where like they're not doing anything to elevate the art form of being a youtuber is like in all of this shit they're they're uh, they they forgot how the whole youtube side of things works they were so worried about becoming a company so worried about the bottom line that they forgot everything about like about why they had an audience in the first place yeah i don't know it's just been this crazy week and then the other reason that it it seems important right now right at least, and this is my opinion, Seijin can agree or disagree with that, is in the wake of, you know, there not being new television or movies and the strike that's going on with the WGA and SAG-AFTRA, like, YouTube rises up as the place where people go for entertainment. We saw it during the writer's strike in 2007. I'll just remind everybody of Dr. Horrible, which was all of those people creating content for the internet because they were not under any sort of obligation to not create for the internet at that time. Mm. Like, so like the internet, but the internet is the big freaking like problem behind this strike. At the same right. time. Right. Like, and, and like this is also something that happened during COVID, too. Not necessarily because people weren't creating, but because we were suddenly consuming so much that we were running out of created entertainment. And so we were turning to things like YouTube in order to, to get more, right? Um, yeah, I, I just... The, the fact that nobody is reaching out... I, I have not heard much about Netflix and Hulu in in these conversations, right? I've heard a lot about Disney. I've heard a lot about about uh, Discovery, HBO. I've heard a lot about um, uh, about Paramount. I've heard a lot about Universal, right? But I've not heard much in regards of the actual kind of big streaming guys or the big internet players. I don't know why people aren't talking to YouTube, who has who makes a ton of original content. I don't know why nobody's talking about like. And it's not that that these are probably not happening behind the scenes, but. I think smartly, these companies are the ones that are smart enough to know how the internet works, and they're 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 not playing that side of the game because they don't want this whole thing to be a public spectacle for them. Right, but something like this, something like the hundred million dollar valued channel having this meltdown, like it rises because it it shines a spotlight on something that's like, please don't notice us, please don't notice what's going on over here on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. And it's YouTube would love it if we didn't pay any attention to that side of the business. But like that it's becoming harder and harder to when when there's more and more and more companies like this and stories like this coming out. Yeah. I don't know. So it just to me it was interesting to be like, wow, my homework this week from Seijin was to go on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, and and so like the channel that I directed is towards right was yeah. it was this guy called Hugbees. He's he he doesn't post all the time, but he does he he does post. Uh, he is a he is a singular creator. He's not involved in any of these com- com- kind of corporations or companies. He's been on on YouTube for about five years now. Um, he's got you know all sorts of various projects. He he does these these silly like one off videos where he takes old like how it's made, or he actually has a series where he also does unwrapped the same way, and then he does his own narration over them. And it, we'll get into that in a second. But like this, but he also does like video game material, video game podcasts. He does like long form video series where he does like a, like top ten favorite outrageous deaths in history and shit like that. So really, really like weird, wild, like good old fashioned YouTube stuff that I really love. Um, and then so in this idea that we are turning to YouTube for like this kind of entertainment gap, right? We're trying to fill it, right? I'm watching this series. Uh, from this guy where he takes old video footage and just redoes it himself. And there's this weird element to it where if he were bigger, this would probably be a problem, right? It's just, 
Uh, it, 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 it's satire. Does it? Is it covered by parody? Like what? Like so? The it's legality a, of what he's doing here. Like that whole thing. <laughs> well, the issue stems from things like YouTube and copyright protection. The fact that uh-huh. he is using the same video footage that right there can trigger a copyright strike. So right. the series without, ha- even, with, without even a human being involved, it could literally just be if, if they've got a, a bot out there searching for a certain video, because this is how they get all of the like SpongeBob channels and shit. If you ever try and watch like an old cartoon and you wonder why it's in suddenly like boxed format or reversed or like every now and then it seems to like play really slow, that is people trying to get around the the algorithm stopping them posting copyrighted material because they literally have like little sniffer bots that go out there and if they if they can catch like more than 30 seconds of a video that matches up with 30 seconds of what they know to be another video, then they'll just shut your shit down. And then you have to come out of your way to be like, yeah, but you missed the part where we were doing this commentary over it, or you missed the part where we were re-editing it to, to do this or say that. Like, like people get kind of caught up in that stuff all the time when what they're doing is doing recreations um, and, and that sort of stuff. Uh, yeah, and I and I and I have to imagine that it's because a he's touching like really light material, like nobody is out there legally defending how it's made. Up. It's like nobody's claiming that that's their livelihood, right? And so, like in that regard, he's kind of safe. And also, there is this idea that he is redoing the commentary over it. It's just it, what's wild to me is in every video he plays with what is true and what is not he will say things that are just obviously completely fabricated funny shit but it's all like buried within a sentence that starts out very reasonable (laughs) and so like there's a moment where you have to go is that true there's like a moment where in every one of his videos where you're like now is that one of his jokes or is that actually how it's made (laughs) yeah so the biggest issue that i had with how it's actually made is it made me want to go out and watch how the four videos I watched, those products are actually made. <laughs> so, like, on, on the other hand, is it, like, weird sort of promotional material for this? Right. Because right. I watched four. The four that I watched were sprinkles, skateboards. Nice. God, I, I like can't it. remember the other two that I watched. I, I'll, one is a good one. What one? The sprinkles one is one of my favorites. I like the sprinkles. Yeah, one the a sprinkles lot. one. I mean, Big Jimmy. He's he's not Big Jimmy. <laughs> um, uh, Strong James. <laughs> Strong James. <laughs> yeah, um, that 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 character worked for me in terms of that. Uh, I wish I could remember the other two freaking ones that I watched. Uh, I didn't partic- really- particularly enjoy it. Is what I'm going to say. Um, it 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 was that type of humor that I'm not a huge fan of. Uh, mirrors, mirrors were another one that I did. I know if I talked through it, I could get to it. Um, I, I don't remember the fourth one. I'm sure it will hit me eventually. Um, but it was all products. It wasn't ones like horses or eggs or, but like eggs I started. And that's where I noticed the whole, this has to be present. Like it's a black square with the video in the small lower quadrant of it. And it says this is how this has to be presented in order to not be copyright struck from YouTube, despite it being parody satire. Yeah. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. I hadn't even considered that that like part of it. Like, I almost wondered if this was sort of stock footage that you could purchase from these companies and then narrate over. Well, and so there's a really interesting thing going on there, too, because there's a lot of companies that are covered by those shows, right? Separate from even doing the YouTube parody stuff right now, just watching those shows in general. Part of the reason that he doesn't get as deep into Unwrapped as he did into How It's Made is because Unwrapped is specific product. Yeah. Like, this is how you make a crunch bar versus this is how you make a crispy rice chocolate bar. And you see so much more on How It's Made. Each and every person. Sorry. It's okay. (laughs) And they, they, they'll do this thing where they'll like they'll go to like a licorice factory as opposed to the Twizzlers factory right like that kind of thing you see that so much on how it's made you see so many videos where they're just like we're gonna go look and see how they make frozen waffles and then at the end the frozen waffles are always like Mike's frozen waffles and like you're like whoa I thought it was just Egos the whole time <laughs> it's like no <laughs> I live with some like some, some other company and so like in that regard that's the other thing is that like it's, it's also not a, a commercial for like specific products most of the time like there's also as you joked about like there's one like horses <laughs> 
<laughs> or there's one like how they make bulldozer like barrels or whatever. Like there's there's all sorts of weird shit on how it's made. Magnets is like a perfect example of this. There's yeah. an entire video on how magnets are made, and that, that's not an advertisement for magnets, right? It kind of is, but at the end of the day, like that's just not how like people purchase magnets. So that's just that's that's not going to happen. Um, so there's also that whole element to it, right? Is like you also have a lot of shows that were being made extremely cheaply because they weren't product based or in any fashion. They didn't have to pay somebody. And then like Unwrapped always has those moments where they talk about like how at this point the popcorn goes into the caramel machine, but we can't show you that because that's a company secret. And you just say to yourself like, don't they just pour caramel on popcorn? That's not a big secret. No, no, they don't just pour caramel on popcorn. <laughs> the ca- the popcorn is spun at exactly 30 RPM. It has to go at 30 RPM because if it were to go faster or slower, it would mean inconsistent, unbalanced coating of caramel on each piece of popcorn. And that's what makes it a screaming yellow zinger. The other one was, you got to hear a little bit of it. Apologies for that. Um, Tequila. I watched tequila as well. And that one was interesting, but also like, Kind of bordered on a little bit like racist humor. Oh yeah, so that's like... the thing about this, right? Is that because this is just some dude that's just been doing this for five years? He's some dude bro from Florida, I think, or or Southern California. But he's some, you know, and like it's, so. There is also that is there's so much more of his personality in it. The good meal, right? Like there's that, and that's kind of the YouTube. That is that is so much more old school YouTube is like you can get into this and you can get on board with this guy, but you have to acknowledge that this is just another human being with no training, no understanding of like the like the culturally like what he is doing or something. Like he's like there's there's so many caveats to having to get on board with following a YouTuber. And like that is something that when you turn it into a company you really try to minimize, right? You really try and kill that. But a lot of the times that when you're doing that, you're also then like really like neutering your talent in a lot of ways. You're taking away what would would bring somebody in to watch it, right? Is the uniqueness that this person brings to the videos. In order to be marketable, everything like sort of needs to be sanitized and Starbucked so that it can be, you know, accepted. (laughs) Well, and it's why, and it's why a lot of people look at things like YouTube nowadays, and and you know talk about it being you know, the tame version of what it used to be. It's just not the same as what it was 10, 15 years ago, and it's not like like and again like like that is probably for the best in a lot of situations, considering the ways in which some things existed on YouTube and still exist on YouTube that that need to be cleaned up. I mean, like kids YouTube notoriously like eventually leading people to like videos of, of women bouncing like naked on balloons and shit like that or like 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 all sorts of weird stuff that you hear about like children's YouTube like leading to like animated videos of, of Disney princesses killing themselves and all this sort of weird shit like that stuff is still a problem for YouTube but it is not nearly as big of a problem as it was not not 10 years ago when they, when they first started this kind of endeavor to become a more legitimate quote unquote business. Right. And, and in that YouTubers have had to go the same route. Right. I mean, like there's also, there's a lot of guys that have nuked old channels of theirs. So like you, you're watching a YouTuber now and you don't know if they had a channel before this that they had to get rid of because they said a bunch of racist shit or they said a bunch of like inappropriate shit. I mean, just think about the ways that we we think about um gamers, right? And and think about like gaming chats and like the jokes about getting onto like Call of Duty chat with like eleven year olds talking about how they want to fuck your mom and all this shit, right? Those twelve year olds were just filming themselves and putting themselves on YouTube ten years ago, right? But now those you those guys those twelve year olds are now twenty two and want to turn their YouTube presence into a more legitimate presence. The first thing that they do is they just nuke a bunch of old videos, if not create a whole new channel and separate themselves entirely from that old material. And then you know we run into the problem of people quote unquote doxing each other, where they go out and find all this new information and put this shit out there. Um, who's the um, Who's the big children's uh, star right now? Um, Bi- Blippy, Bippy, Bippy, right? Um, <laughs> Bippo. Or, yeah, I know who you're talking yeah, about. But, but, I'll get the but, actual um, pronunciation. But he's the, but you know, he's this huge YouTube star to the point where he's got the, the YouTube channels. He's got cartoons up that are being created. There, there, there's you know talks of like movie stuff and all this shit, right? Definitely a bunch of merchandise. The guy started out doing a bunch of prank YouTubes, and there's straight up one where he, in actuality, no special effects deposits fecal matter onto a friend 
and that is like something that people found out of like six months ago or so like oh my god blippy shit on his friend and it became like a huge fucking deal for him about how he had to come out and like talk about how that was an old you know he he was he was immature then and it was like bad like they were doing like jackass style videos and at some point a la jackass it just got so like he got so deep in the paint uh, in to like prank youtube that he was doing straight up just like disgusting shit on his youtube channel that he now sells himself as this like children's entertainer and so he had to like step away from that and like they, they had raced through that channel he was no longer associated with it but the internet never forgets man <laughs> Yeah, uh, Blippy. It is Blippy. I just wanted Blippy, to make sure yeah. that L and the B they, they just kind of blend together. Yeah, I remember hearing about that, and it's just one of those situations where, I mean, the past catching up with people. I mean, look at James Gunn, who's now going to be the head of an entire film thing, and where he was. God, we talked about it on this show, freaking four years ago, in terms yeah. of his cancellation because of old content. Well, and again, you, you, we have to be very careful when we talk about things like cancellation, because in this exact case, right, doesn't seem like he ever really stopped working, right? No, <laughs> like, well, no, I mean, but, no, no. Well, it was but, one of those situations where, like, James Gunn is canceled was the, the, the fervor around it. And, like, yeah. they weren't going to let him do the third movie of that trilogy that came out this year. Like that was that was where it was. And then, like, with time, they decided, no, we'll we'll, we'll let it happen still. And I still have theories about it, but again, it's all tied to stuff we can't talk about right now. But it is. It's one of those situations where, because of the more permanence of the internet, people's pasts have this way of coming up. And then, like, to, to go, like, one step further than that, in the fact that, like, we're kind of being trained that, like, it was their past, you have something like Donald Trump being able to become president. Yeah, I mean, like, like having to try it. Well, because what we're ta what we're getting into, and this is a conversation that not enough people have when they talk about this stuff. They see it as a very black and white thing of either you care about what somebody did in their past or you don't. And it's like, no, <laughs> I care about what everybody did in their past. And I also care about how they have grown since or from those, in like from, you know what I mean? Exactly, like, exactly. And, I know, and, yeah. And, and that is the more nuanced conversation that some people can't seem to wrap their heads around. And this is, I, 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 I don't want to both sides of this issue because at the end of the day, there's one side of this conversation that I think is doing immense amounts of damage. And there's another side of this conversation that I think is a little, got its head up its own ass, but they're not hurting anybody. Right. And, and in that regard. And like, and so like, so there's this idea that like, that, that everybody needs to learn that, but there's a certain group of people in this world that I think really need to, or else we're all fucked. <laughs> But, but to get back to like the homework, right? Yeah. It's part of the reason why I have been kind of, I think, latching on so much to going back to, to Hug Bees and the work that he's been doing, again, for years, right? Like, like the, he's been doing this for, for five or six years now. And, and the reason that I have is there is, a, there is a charmingness to the genuine nature of the work being done. It is ridiculous. It is stupid. It is slightly offensive. It is all of this shit that we talk about with, with entertainment often being that... I, because of the position that I'm in in multiple ways, have the privilege to be able to take it in and just have fun with it that some people may not, right? Like, there's all sorts of things that, that there's all sorts of caveats to any type of YouTube entertainment nowadays. And so, like, it is interesting to me to kind of watch a guy doing that, being in that realm nowadays with everything else that we are talking about with YouTube. I mean, even some of my more, like, like day-to-day uh, -day definitive youtubers guys i will go to every day for a video right like guys like markiplier guys like matt pat guys like jack septicaya that i mentioned earlier right like i will go after those videos on a daily basis and they are still doing really personable stuff but all of those guys i just mentioned openly talk about how they are like millionaires worth a certain amount of money now and they are they are top tier like echelon elite youtube like in terms of payment and in terms of like the ways that they market themselves but none of those guys are in charge of a full corporation, right? Like, like Matt Pat actually, I think, just sold off the whole like Game Theory YouTube to a German company, so he's still there and he's still a creative person there, but he's not in charge anymore and has been very open about some of that stuff going on. Obviously, creatively, I think that he's got a lot of control, but in terms of like the money, he, it's not something he worries about anymore because a, 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 some company on the other side of the world takes care of it for him, right? And then like guys like like Mark are are 
kind of like diving and putting their money into things like movies and television projects and stuff like that and doing his own thing so he doesn't have like a full company i'm sure that there is some incorporated ver the version of his of his finances in order to work as a youtuber but like he's not out there like pushing a company that he he owns like there's this there's this level to all of this stuff that everybody is playing this game and i happen to follow these guys that are aware of the game acknowledge the game maybe even succeeding in the game but but they're not trying to use the game to gain me and that is where youtube personalities really kind of lie for me and i think it's part of the reason why i maybe never latched onto the line is tech tip stuff is because at the end of the day i i as the watcher become the product and that's that's not what i want to be when i'm taking in my entertainment right unfortunately the way that capitalist america works you're always the fucking product in the end like and that's i'm not stupid i'm not ignorant to that but the more layers of of distance i can put between myself and that truth the better right i get that that makes sense i don't know i mean youtube is not something i ever really used as a form of entertainment until a year before we started this show like that's and i'm not talking and and even then you like, said that but that's what eight years ago now right yeah like so, I mean, and it, it was just one of those situations where, by the nature of my new job, there was a lot of, like, silence as I was working, and I'm like, well, I'll just throw something up on YouTube, and that will be my entertainment to get me through this. Because, like, music didn't really work because I want to sing along to music. Very rarely do I want to, like, talk along to a video I've watched before or things like that. But it was this whole thing, I mean, from the nature of being on the ocean, where I didn't really have access to YouTube as a thing to watch, and then just working in other jobs where, like, there was no downtime. And it's not like, you know, office work inherently, like, lends itself to that. But in a job that is very reactive, not proactive, you have downtime. And that is what YouTube is perfect at filling is that downtime and then yeah, the, the problem is is that is we've got a lot of people in this country that have downtime in in other ways and so you're talking about it in your situation like with work and all that stuff right but like there's also 10 year old kids out there who have got nothing but downtime right especially during the summer months especially during spring breaks especially if they're if they're being um homeschooled in some fashion like things like that we we have it is you're right that it's really good filler for downtime the next step though is to like think about like what does downtime look like for for everybody out there and and the ways in which it becomes really dangerous is in these groups where there's so much downtime yeah i mean even look at look at my father right this is the person who for the last two birthdays i have given him a premium youtube subscription and the reason for that is once he retired YouTube became his literal obsession. He watches like so many things that interest him before. Like he watches like eight or nine cruising channels. He watches things yeah. about like war hardware and, and military like stuff like that. And it's stuff I mean, that like ways, YouTube kind of filled the promise that streaming always made, but never quite filled. Right. Yeah. We, we've, we've always mentioned that like streaming kind of walked in the door with this promise of like you being in control of your entertainment. And that's not true. Right. Like the ways in which they've worked, like there's still contracts that are still getting in the way of me watching what I want. There's still like, as, as much as we touted Netflix kind of breaking the mold in terms of how television shows would be created, they stuck to some pretty classic formulas, right? There's still, there's still the first act, second act, third act formats. There's still, they, they, even though a video, uh, even though an episode of maybe an hour and 20 minutes this time oh my god they've really shook things up they don't really go beyond that it's not like you watch a show where like one episode is two and a half hours and the next episode is 20 guess where that happens though that happens on youtube all the fucking time you may have a creator that's like i didn't really feel like recording much today but i wanted to pose for you guys so here's 10 seconds of me farting and then they put that up and then the next day they're like here's a three hour long video of me breaking down the history of jazz it's like okay we're okay guys like and and anybody can do that and that's the other side of the promise is that 
not only is this kind of the entertainment being brought to you that you that we that you'd always wanted that ability to go out and watch exactly what you want to watch at this exact moment for as long as you want you want a two-hour video that that talks about what military hardware we got that you want a 10-minute video that talks about military hardware we got that too right there's that aspect of it but then the other side of that is also do you want to make a two-hour video about military content we've got a way for you to do that and have it actually mean like reach an audience so like youtube kind of became that promise that we had always wanted from these streaming services that never came to fruition yeah i've gosh i did not think that we would figure out how it's actually made youtube by watching for how it's actually made videos from Hugbees, but damn it, Seijin. <laughs> Look at you having a thesis and proving it. <sighs> it's like, you know, we, we yeah. are we are at a threshold moment in, in the ways in which we consume. It's not that I feel like things are going to be better or worse after the strike or anything like that, because I don't know. But I can tell you this, things are going to be different. And like, whatever that looks like, I, like we we need to as consumers make sure we're protecting ourselves. And stuff like the Linus Tech Tips stuff, that is that is a version of us protecting ourselves. Like keeping an eye on that, looking under the hood there, seeing a company that gets valued at a hundred million dollars that is now responsible for a good large sector of the edutainment um, uh, YouTube factor, and realizing that it's all just one big marketing tool. Like that is that is consumer protection at work. Yeah. I am. Um, yeah, it's true. And it's it's so weird that it needs to like police itself that way. But if you by the nature of creating an entity like YouTube, like that's the goal, isn't it? Is to have like YouTube. Yeah. 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 Mm hmm. Yeah, no, it, it is. And on the other side of this that we've also not really touched on because it's really hard for us to talk about is like the globalization nature of this whole thing is part of what makes this really hard is is that um, Linus Media Group um, started as a Canadian company and I think is run out of Europe somewhere, right? From some of the stuff that I've been reading, not necessarily that they're even a European company. They may still be considered a Canadian company, but they've got like one of their big headquarters where a lot of this information has been kind of coming out and a lot of stuff has been talked about has been over there. Oh. Right? Oh, I didn't Which know, but I just know about them being in Victoria, B.C., British yeah, Columbia, yeah. so, so I didn't know. Again, like, I, th I do believe the company is, ma ma um, is majorly focused up there, but they have workers all over the world is essentially the point that I'm getting at, right? Is like yeah. There is also this globalization side of this whole thing in that the, the value of work and the value of the worker – are very greatly from from place to place even across canada from place to place but but across the world like and the ways in which if you're going to start a company like this you really need to take a good hard look at you and your values and what you're going to do with that company and also the values of where you are working right because you know if you want to be a capitalist and run people into the ground in order to make your buck there, there are countries that are here for you to do that hi america is, is looking for you <laughs> right but the other side of that is then don't don't go ahead and open up a branch in norway dude like if you're like if that's the way you want to treat people make sure you're not going into places that don't want you to work that way right um yeah, and, and and that's the other side of all of this is is like the ways in which we also kind of have to acknowledge how everybody else behaves in addition to just ourselves. They want it to be so insular, but they've gone worldwide. You can't keep shit under wraps at that at that level. Yeah, I mean, I think the uh, one of the other big bigger things that was brought out as a controversial statement is this thing that uh, if his team ever wanted to unionize, he'd consider himself a failure. Because he doesn't want to create an environment where the people feel like they need a union to have worker rights and everything like that. And that's such a, like, I understand where he's coming from as management. But, like, that's not necessarily all a union is about. It's not that you did a bad job. It just might be, like, we feel like our voice isn't heard. <laughs> Let's talk about contracts, right? Yeah. Like, this is, this is a con, like, it, like contracts should always be written if you are a friend and you open your door to a friend come and live with you because they're going through a hard time and, and you say to them look you're always welcome to stay on uh, you know you're always welcome to stay with me that's great if they're going to stay with you beyond just a couple of nights you need to have a serious conversation about what the boundaries and the rules are and if it's a serious enough conversation it might even be time to introduce something like a lease 
right? And yeah. people get really weird about that. Like, oh, my friend got divorced from his wife and got kicked out of his house, and he lived with me for six months. And, like, it's this idea that, like, at that point, you should probably have a contract, right? And people get really squishy about that kind of thing, right? Or, like, I bought a car from my friend, and we did it all under the table. He just gave me 100 bucks, and we just we called it good. There's a lot of problems with that, because DMV is going to need some type of proof that the car was sold so that they can figure out taxes. They need to figure out that the ownership would, did, really did change hands. So you can't just do that shit under the table. So in a weird way, like, the government forces you to have a contract in that, in that situation, right? But, but that's only to protect everyone involved. We need to we need to destigmatize the idea that like sometimes some paperwork needs to change hands because in the larger scale this is exactly where that kind of attitude specifically with unions comes comes into play and that needs to be just completely like tossed out that's bullshit you you doing a good job as management so you your worker shouldn't need a union is complete BS. You doing a good job as management should welcome a union because what you get to then say is, as a good manager, I get to set some very specific terms that the union, if you're a good manager, should be able to quickly agree with. And then you have the ability to hold people to that. This is something that people don't really think about with unions because they think they see unions as being so anti-company. And they are, but, but there is also this idea that if a company is willing to work with a union, there is also ways in which that company benefits. And to ignore that, to ignore the idea that you then get to hold people to a very specific standard that they illegally agreed to via a third party. Like, the union is a third party in this conversation. They are, for all intents and purposes, like, kind of divorced. We see them as constantly protecting the worker in this country just because of how poorly workers have been treated in this country. The reason that we see unions as anti-company is because companies are so bad, the unions have always had to be the ones to slap them on the wrists. Imagine a world where the companies are behaving so well that the union actually has to at some point take the company's side to tell the worker, no, you're just not doing what we agreed you would do. And I've seen that happen. I've seen union workers get fired from theater gigs because they're not doing what the union is asking from them. It's not that the union won't step in and get rid of it, dude. They just make it so that a company can't just do that by the fucking seat of their pants, right? Like, they can, they'll have to actually, like, hold people to a standard. And standards are good across the board for everyone involved. Like, if he wants to, if he wants to pull the whole, I should be such a good manager that they shouldn't need, you know, they shouldn't need a contract to agree with me on things, that's great, man. But, like, every, every kind of handshake agreement, as far as I'm concerned, should come with a signed document as well. Like, well, it just yeah, doesn't... it's not a handshake agreement if it doesn't, if it has a signed document, but I get what you're saying. I understand no, where I, you're coming like, from with that, like yeah. If you're gonna, if you're gonna start with a handshake agreement, at some point you should get paper involved. Yeah, I agree. And it is, and also what we're looking at with it, that sentiment that he expressed, right? And then everybody being like, I feel overworked. I feel like these deadlines are killing me. That's the type of stuff that a union would be like. And the, the expectation of these workers is a little too high. <laughs> yes. Like, it's, it's really, like, I understand where that comes in. All right. I think we've talked enough about YouTube today. As crazy as that may sound. Are you ready to? My task was crazy. I will admit right up that my task, it's been making my eyes like kind of roll around in my head. But I had fun doing it. I hope that you enjoyed it, CJ. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you asked me to pick three songs that were recreated songs by the original artist, right? Yes, that is correct. Right. I mean, like, I could have known six the last time we talked. I wish so. It was, uh, what, what has been driving you so crazy about this task, Dev? Is, uh, well, I guess, like, what I'm trying to, I, I, try, like, I don't know what my, okay, the whole, I want to start with a story. I would like to start with an anecdote in order to where this even came from. And where this came from, as most issues in my life come, was at a bar trivia night. I was at a place called Rock and Coal. They did. They were a pizza place, and I happened to be there on the night of bar trivia, and it was all musical based. And the track that played 
was the first track that is going to be, we're going to put out a playlist of all these songs so you can go out there and listen. It's going to be on Spotify. Just know that, that we're going to try to put this out so you can hear these songs and compare and see all of that stuff. I think maybe my issue season was that I try, was trying to make this task bigger than it needed to be. <laughs> If I, I, I'm actually, I'm sitting here scrambling to check if the songs I found are are on Spotify. Sorry, keep going. No, and that, and and that, and also when you talk about music the way that I intend to talk about music in this little segment, you're really kind of opening up yourself, right? You're sharing a part of yourself and the music that you enjoy because if it's something that you've taken note of, it's probably something that you enjoy, right? So it's a little bit of soul bearing that's going on with this. So back to rock and cold pizza. God, it must've been like 2017 or 2018. It was long enough ago that I was still going to bar trivia nights and they played the first song that I'm going to be featuring all for you by sister Hazel. Now each song that was played, you had to identify the artist, the title of the song and the year that it released. And in this round, I got a score of 29 because of the 10 songs that were played. The only one I didn't know the year of release on was sister Hazel's all for you. And that bothered me. That bothered me on a real level because I was pretty sure that song came out in 1997. So then I Googled it afterwards after trivia had ended and you can look at your phones again without, like, everybody else in the bar, like, creating a mob and, and, and demanding mob-style justice from you for being on your cell phone during the trivia portion of the evening. Uh-huh. And I find that the version of Sister Hazel's All For You that he played, and now that's the important thing about this whole thing, was off of their second album that was released in 1997. And the person who did the the thing said that the song came out in 1994. Now, I had no idea. And I've seen Sister Hazel in in concert, which maybe that can represent something or maybe it means nothing. Um, That the song had originally been an acoustic number on their first album that kind of went nowhere in 1994. So that acoustic version of All For You by Sister Hazel has all but been supplanted in the minds of listeners by that version that came out on their on their second album. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. okay. that's the okay. one that actually had radio airplay and charted. And it was such an interesting thing to me that then this guy would be like, but the song's from 97. And then me, I'll be pedantic again. I'm like, yeah, but you played the 97 version of the song. So like... Where is it? And we ended up having a good conversation about music. So, like, it was all a wash. And I won anyway, getting 29 points out of 30. But it's something that has always kind of stuck with me. So then again, listening to Fast Car and its various covers, I wanted to think about covers of songs that have made more of a lasting impression than, like, the original album version of that song. And that's where we are right now. So, I mean, Sister Hazel is kind of an example. So it's not one of my three. But Siege, if you want to lead us off, that'd be cool. Um, yeah. So part of the thing is that, like, I have got... Um, <laughs> so part of the reason I was scrambling to see if they were available on, on, on Spotify is I was specifically going after some rare ones that I have grown to love in my life, but I can never find anywhere is part of the problem. Now, I can find them on YouTube, so I know I'm not crazy. They definitely exist. But, like, in terms of the availability on things like Spotify, going out and finding an album, going to, you know, uh, wherever the hell you're getting your music nowadays, like, it wasn't always coming through. And I think that part of that comes from, like, these are versions of these songs that I ran into for various reasons. Most of the time, it's things like movie soundtracks or television soundtracks, right? But we can't, obviously can't talk about that and won't talk about that too much this time around. But the other thing that really kills this, and, and I said this after we, we, we mentioned this is what we wanted to talk about this week, is that we grew up in the era of Napster, LimeWire, right? Um, what, was, what were some of the other ones that people were using back then? Mo- um, on, on the- uh, Morpheus. Morpheus. Mozilla. Yeah, Morpheus. Yeah, yeah just... But, like, from that, there was, and I think we've talked about this before, there was so much misinformation 
And you talk about like versions that became popular because of the radio play. There are versions of songs that became popular because of the shared music era. Oh right? yeah, like that whole that whole idea of of, of like getting. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of a what's the song by Eve Six that um, that everybody inside out labels. is that the one where where they call Heart in a Blender right like yeah. that's the one that everybody yeah. calls Heart in a Blender because that's the way that it was like for me uh, the reason that I call it that is like that's how it came to be on LimeWare and then I found out years later that wasn't the actual name of that song or finding out um, so uh, let's give one of my big my first favorites today for the longest time I have been trying to figure out um, the the gospel version of pressure drop that i had always attributed to the original band that created that song pressure drop toots and the Maytales. and toots and the Maytales pressure drop is first of all a phenomenal song and they themselves recorded two versions of that song there's a much more traditional kind of um uh, Jamaican uh, slow rock version that they do and the only reason I don't call it the ska version is they put out a very specific version that is the ska version of Pressure Drop by Toots and the Maytales so they themselves recorded two versions of that song that were released around the same time in the late 60s early 70s and those two versions are floating around eventually on a on a film that I adore and we will all talk about someday there is a there is a version that gets played because it was really popular in the 80s that is the gospelized version of that song. And I had forever attributed them, the Chutes and the Maytales, to that because both I knew the history of the song in general and everywhere that I ever found that version of it, that is the name that I had always seen associated with it. I had not realized that on that particular film soundtrack in 1986, which is what that movie's referencing, it was actually a version of that song um, recorded by the specials. And that's like a whole other kettle of fish because like ska and jazz and all of that, like that those are those are genres that have standards, right? So getting multiple bands doing different versions of of the same song, like happens all over the fucking place in, in, in those genres, right? And so I had always associated that version of the song with Toots and the Maytales, but it's not them. I found that out through doing that research this week, but I will still use Pressure Drop, and I would recommend the Sky version just because it's a little bit quicker and a little bit more upbeat and all that, um, but if you want to listen to the original version that's out there too, but Pressure Drop by Toots and the Maytales, and specifically the Sky version is, is one of my favorites. Okay, and the Sky version would be the cover, right? Uh, so yeah, so that's the one that, that came out later, yeah. All right, cool. I, I dig that. I just want to do that. Um, ba 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 ba. Cool. Yeah, I like no, that. No, and that's and that's. To, it has to be the one that comes out later because the other version is just called Pressure Drop. <laughs> so it's like that reggae rock version, and then they have Pressure Drop ska version. So they clearly see that version as the secondary version to the original, right? Yeah. I mean, that's it. That's how a lot of these remixes or things like that kind of work. So I get you. <laughs> cool. Um, I guess I will I will lead off with again I'm bearing my soul here right and I've already bared my soul on this one before but uh, yeah uh, so Brian Wilson by the Bare Naked Ladies uh, it's actually an interesting one so it's on their first studio album Gordon we have an episode called 30 Years of Gordon if you want to hear us talk more on that album but the song Brian Wilson um, has this really interesting trajectory where they write that song as sort of like that satire talking about becoming a big musician and then suffering a Brian Wilson style breakdown. Right. But then when Brian Wilson is better, right. No longer lying in bed the way that he did, he is out and he's performing and he covers that song and Brian Wilson covering Brian Wilson is so significant to the band that they begin performing their own song in the style that Brian Wilson performed their song. And then in 1996, when they do their rock spectacle album, actually it was 98 that that one came out. Sorry. I, I had my, my date screwed up there. Um, no, it's 96. It comes out, Devin, trust yourself. When rock spectacles comes out, the live version of Brian Wilson on that is Brian Wilson's version of Brian Wilson as performed by the Bare Naked Ladies. And that is the one that gets all the radio play, right? As opposed to the original one was just a track on that album. It really wasn't a single there. 
Mm -hmm. And it becomes so significant to the band that when it comes time to do their greatest hits album in 2001, the version that they put on there is that live version of Brian Wilson. So like, that's not just an example of like, the the cover version being the like more known version of that song, but the band itself acknowledging we could have done this better <laughs> in a way. So, you know, Brian Wilson, you got to use Brian Excellent. Wilson there. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. My number two slot uh, was uh, we, so so we mentioned the offspring last week when when we talked about this, I was like all excited because the offspring had a a, a live album come out. They had uh, they've actually had multiple live albums come out and all this. Um, but I also whenever somebody talks about like uh, not covers, but remakes of songs, right? Like that one of the first ones that always pops into my head is for the offspring is defy you. It's this kind of like what's interesting to me about it is it's not one of their biggest songs it is definitely one of their bigger songs in terms of popularity but it's not one of the first songs people think of when they think of the offspring and it's definitely um uh, in this world we know that there are two offsprings right every album seems to feature two different bands <laughs> there is like the goofy like like satirical um kind of california rock like group that that we see in guys like pretty fly for a white guy right um and and songs like that but then there is also this other side to them where they do some pretty freaking hard shit like i mean that's when we start to think about like smash and that and that whole album um and this is on that side of things it is not the more fun poppy side of of offspring that you get but rather on that more like hard rock side right and defy you is is one of those really like it is I don't know if, if Offspring qualifies as a new metal band, but they definitely have new metal like influences in a lot of their stuff, right? And they they have that in the original version of Defy You. So hearing an acoustic version of that song is wild in that like it really becomes just about like the lyrics and the ways in which um uh what's his name Dexter um sings, right? Like his his voice and his inflection on those words and like that whole that whole song becomes so much more pointed it comes so much more like rough and tumble like so much more not mean but like and not angry but just like defiant right like which is which is the whole concept of the song and it's always really hit me because i grew up with like the goofy offspring when people would talk about the offspring i kind of put them in the same kind of slot in my head as like a blink 182 right like growing up with 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 very specific hits from them um never gonna drink again you know um worst hangover which worst is hangover. i think the real name of that song yeah. is worst hangover um then uh what's the um what's the De Niro song like oh, <laughs> um, but, uh, but there's like a whole bunch of like goofier songs of theirs that that's what my friends listened to that's what was in the movies that's what was on MTV pretty fly for a white guy was like one of the first like music videos I remember like like taking in right at some point like so so to be able to not only hear the harder side of offspring and then on top of that hear the like really like rawest version of that was wild and i heard it like one night sitting in my car like i think i was like at the drive-in or something like waiting for something to start but i was sitting in my car and they were interviewing um uh, the band for for their latest album being out and it, it was like npr so they were doing like some in-studio stuff and one of the things they did was the acoustic version of defy you and i immediately fell in love with it and again this was the era of like limewire and napster and all this shit so i was also able to go home and immediately find that version of that song that was probably ripped from that radio recording and like listen to that right um and and as I said earlier, it also becomes one of those really rare tracks because it doesn't, as far as I can tell, ever get put onto an album for them, right? But it's still floating around out there because you can Google it and there is a YouTube video that comes up of it. But there And there are acoustic versions out by other people, right? But not by them. This is specifically, though, this acoustic version by them. So due to its rare nature, due to its, like, raw nature, and, and due to just kind of, like, where I was at at the time that I heard it, this song is, like like tops for me in this conversation whenever we talk about that idea of like weird versions of songs that bands did of their own music this is always one of the first ones that pops into my head that's cool i dig that i do i do and like ah oh god the offspring are a band i will 
I will always remember, there was one of those English teachers that like everybody kind of had a crush on. I'm sure you had one of those in your school, right? Is that a thing that everybody has? Yeah. It doesn't yeah. have to be an I English teacher, but like... Go with this before I... <laughs> what? Well, no, so... I sure you go with this before I, before I jump on board. Okay. Well, I, I did not have said crush on said English teacher, but everybody seemed to have this crush on this one English teacher. And my most significant moment with her, well, there's two. She's the reason that I, I lived on campus my freshman year, because she told me that if I didn't do it, I would regret it. Have the full college experience your freshman year, Devin. Otherwise, you'll regret it. That And that is like, I, I thank her for that advice, right? But the other one is, it was some random Monday, and I was going to be late to homeroom, and she stopped me in the hallway, and she's like, I need to talk to you about the offspring. And I'm like, yeah, sure, what's going on? And she's like, did you know that they've been a band for 20 years? And I go, yeah, they started in 1984. They've been around for a while. And then, like, they had that renewed sort of popularity because Pretty Fly for a White Guy hit. Like, it's been weird. But, yeah, they've been a band for this long time. She's like, I knew of all the students in this school, I could say that to you and you would know that. So thank you. (laughs) And I remember being like, man, there are guys in this school who would give their left nut for the interaction that I just had with you. And me, I'm like, there's just a Monday, right? I'm late to class. <laughs> and right, Dyson, calm down. What? <laughs> For me, it was a Tuesday. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, there's this, there's kind of this like, the offspring are just there, like kind of in the background. Yeah. For everybody, like everybody kind of is just kind of digs the offspring maybe not the same songs maybe not the same albums even there are definitely albums of theirs that are divisive amongst the the fans but i don't think i've ever met anybody that is not just like down on some offspring sure like <laughs> yeah it's like everybody out there owns like an like an, like an offspring album somewhere in their at, at some point in their life if you were buying cds or cassette tapes at some point one of those was an offspring album whether or not you like dove into it head first and never stopped listening to it or you just put it on once or twice you still owned it <laughs> i won a copy of splinter that is splinter, like the splinter. big thing and splinter was you I, want to, I love that album but that is definitely one of the more divisive that's ones. what i was gonna say you want to talk divisive albums because like, they sold it off of hit that hit that was like yeah. the radio song off of that album and like that's mm-hmm. where i won it and then i listened to it and i'm like Wow, every other song on this album is better than Hit That, which feels like it was genetically engineered to be like on the radio. But then there are songs in there where I'm like, man, I'm feeling something in this. So, yeah, I I get that. I understand where you're coming from. And then, like, I love their greatest hits album. Just like if I'm going to be playing video games, that's like the background music I want on. Yeah, I mean, Americana, which is the one that has Pretty Fly for a White Guy on it, is pretty yeah. good. Ixnay Off the Ombre is, is like, oh. the one that I really kind of came, like, came to my offspring fruition was, was through that one. I mean, but you can't deny Snash, like, Self-Esteem, Come Out and Play are both on Smash. Like, those, yeah. the, there are such good definitive albums from them, and, like, good, like, good, like, I'm chronologically defining songs from them for me for all sorts of reasons, right? Like, like, and I just adore like their whole discography, but there is something very, very unique about hearing just like his voice and a guitar doing defy you that I heard like on a radio at nine o'clock at night, one night as I was sitting in my car that like has just never left my brain. Cool. I hope it's out there for me to find. Cause I love it. I love that story. Um, And going off of Greatest Hits, my second one that I want to present, and I may have teased this, so I'm sorry if it's it's repeated content or anything like that, but it was important to me. And the big reason is, um, so Bowling for Soup is a band that I don't necessarily love. Uh, For me, they are 1985, which as soon as I found out that 1985 itself was a cover um, by an SR-71 song, like... The, the Bowling for Soup 1985 is dead to me because the original one by SR71 is such a better song than the like kind of pop punky nature of what Bowling for Soup did to that particular tune 
in their version. Plus, they replaced Fast Times at Ridgemont High with St. Elmo's Fire. And I like Fast Times more than St. Elmo's Fire. Sue me. But along that same thing, in addition to just sort of being 1985 and the theme song to a show about stepbrothers on the Disney Channel... Again, we're avoiding things. I almost forgot about that little thing that we got going on. Um, Dale, I bought her their Greatest Hits album. And we're driving around in my car at the time. So she's like, will you put this on your iPod so we can listen to it every once in a while? And I did that. I put it on my iPod. This is still where, like, the era of iPods. But, like, also not the era of iPods. I didn't get into YouTube until 2017. So, like, I was using my iPod... Like, this was probably 2012, 2013, maybe even, like, a little bit later. And because it's on there and because the way that I listen to my iPod so frequently is just by shuffling all of the songs that are on it, occasionally I'd get one of Dale's Bowling for Soup songs off their Greatest Hits album, uh, Songs People Actually Liked. And the song that really speaks to me off of that album, uh, or just a song by them, is Punk Rock 101. So then when I eventually do sign up for Spotify and come into like modern methods of consuming music, I look up Punk Rock 101. And then because I'm like Devin Decker and I'm a weird fucking purist, I want to make sure that I'm getting it off of the actual album. And so I play the album version and I notice this slight difference. And that's when I found out that for their greatest hits album, rather than it just being a compilation of songs people actually liked, they actually re-recorded all 20 songs that are on that album. And the Punk Rock 101 version that they re-recorded on that album is so much better. And I think the difference between them is the first time they do a song like Punk Rock 101 on the original album version, it it's like them like kind of feeling probably a little bit stuck. Like we're still at like this this phase and we're not finding success, but then when you're yeah. at the the size where you're putting out a greatest hits album, and you're re singing yeah. that song, like you know that it got better from that, right? <laughs> so like there's a whole sort of enthusiasm behind the song now that is really infectious and kind of makes the song more hopeful than hopeless than the original one, and also now whenever I hear it. It's like stations or or anything has defaulted to that greatest hits version of it because it is that that like more hopeful version. So it's a weird sort of thing. But like, first of all, I never realized that like that was the thing that people could do for greatest hits albums. <laughs> <laughs> like, I didn't know that was allowed. Like, <laughs> breaking the rules on greatest hits albums, though, I love it when a greatest hits album is something better than just you're just like we we you know basically a variety album. Like, um, <laughs> I, I think of um, uh, international super hits with Green Day, where that that album that is their greatest hits album actually opens up with two new songs. <laughs> right. Well, I love the new song on the greatest hits album because like you're saying as a band, this is going to be a greatest hit. We're right? calling this. Yeah, we're calling yeah. it. Um, and that. But then I also really like a greatest hits album where they use it as an excuse to maybe bring in B sides or one offs. Mm -hmm. Like I think of like a decade of Steely Dan where the 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 song FM that they had done for a a, 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 little, a soundtrack is the opening track off of that. And like that's interesting. Or um, to, to go back to the Baronica Ladies and disc one, all their greatest hits, they have like that cover of the Bruce Cockburn song, Lovers in the Dangerous Time. And like that was just on a an, an album that was done to raise money. Like that, <laughs> like so, like it's so cool when like a greatest hits album can be more than just all of the songs that you know. And then to yeah. go that step further that Bowling for Soup did to re record these songs in their current headspace. It really elevated that whole album and anything on there would actually fit this. But the one where I first noticed it was Punk Rock 101. And I got to tell you, there, there, there are times where I feel that hopelessness that they talk about in Punk Rock 101 or mm -hmm. that hopefulness that they talk about in the re-recording off of their Greatest Hits album. And that's interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. 
so my last one is um i promise this is not a total bummer but it is uh definitely one that that is a little bit more heavy than the other two um about five months ago when my march march was five months ago about yeah um the release of um olivia newton john singing with dolly parton jolene um which was a part of a project of olivia newton john's uh, before she passed of her going out with uh, going out and, and recording singing songs with artists that she just hadn't gotten to work with yet before she passed um and so the version of jolene that dolly and olivia duet together um that is available up on youtube um it, it is an official video from like the from the family and all that like and, and there's a little bit of a interview i think on either side of it if i remember correctly um but uh but essentially uh getting to watch olivia newton john and dolly parton sing jolene together is um uh, first of all just phenomenal and then add to that you know the nature of it being olivia newton john really trying to um you know doing doing something that she clearly loves right it's it's rare that we get to see an artist kind of like throw themselves into a project that it was really more meaningful to them than than anything else in the world right like we're very often especially when it comes to like youtube or when it comes to the music industry like we're, we're seeing a lot of um studio interference shall we say people that are doing things because that's just the way that the the algorithm works or the or that the studio system needs them to do um but olivia newton john being in the place where she was at like didn't have to abide by any of that and so it's just her just doing what she wants um yeah and uh there's a this gorgeous version where they they split the verses and then they sing the chorus together um and so it also makes the song really interesting because it's a song that's not traditionally a duet right and so it kind of becomes this really interesting like two voices like calling out in this story that freddie that doesn't know the lyrics of joe lily and it's a, it's a woman pleading with her husband's lover to 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 leave him Be, uh, he, there's there's something to be said about like the the depths of the relationship but essentially the the pain that is present in that song is what makes that song so fascinating is like you have this beautiful voice of dolly parton singing and with these beautiful harmonies and she's just kind of lamenting like that she is not as as beautiful as this other woman but that she that she doesn't have much in her life except for this man so to please don't don't take her from her right and to turn that into two voices it becomes a whole other level of conversation. It, it's it, it's really really interesting, and then like I said, you layer on top of that the whole concept of it is is beautiful. Cool, I dig it. I can dig it. <laughs> cool, I like that. Um, oh, which means I I get to talk now, right? Like I just I first of all before we go to Dolly Parton, I dig how often she re-records her stuff in new and exciting <laughs> ways. So well, I think more than I think more than most um, performers, she really understands the business side of music as it was when she was coming up in it, right? Yeah. And what I mean by that is like like she isn't just a singer, she isn't just a performer. She also like famously was like writing songs for other people. She also famously was producing other people. I mean, uh, her connections to Miley Cyrus. I won't like like talk about them like I know them intimately, but she is she is Miley Cyrus's godmother. She's related. She's in the family, and she has done a lot to mentor M Miley Cyrus through throughout her career and in a lot of ways has really kind of been probably the sole reason that Miley Cyrus is able to like like be the perform like powerhouse performer that she is now and didn't get lost in like the Disney like like pipeline and all that shit or worse considering what we've seen from other like pop stars of her era yeah. right um it's really, really fascinating to to look at the career of, of, of Dolly Parton and everything that she she learned and, and the the kind of businesswoman that she's become in that world and then look at the ways that she's touched other performers. I mean, um, her version of uh, My Heart Will Go On, right, that, that she ends up giving to Whitney Houston. when Not, when not My Heart Will Go On, thing, My right? Love Will Go yeah. On. My Love Will Go On, thank you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, like, like her version of that, that she gives over to this album slash movie, but really it's really for for for, for the... For, for what we go back to <laughs> regarding that IP, the album is really the bigger thing in there, right? And, um, and yeah, I Will so Always like, Love You is the name of this song. I'm you. just like, yeah. even that's not right. Like, <laughs> No, but it's uh, and I Will Always Love You, which is the one that, that Whitney Houston ends up going on, on to to basically become her anthem, right? Yeah. Whew. 
Jeez, that, yeah, uh, Dolly Parton is a treasure. That that that's just it. And screw you for bringing her up with the passing of another treasure like Olivia Newton John. <laughs> You're just pulling out all the heartstrings, aren't you, you son of a bitch? And now I gotta be the asshole who's here like I'm talking about cheap trick. Yeah, that's fine. Let's talk about some cheap trick. Um, and and really what I'm talking about is I want you to want me because in terms of like known versions of songs that version off of that Budokan is for all intents and purposes I want you to want me by cheap trick like it's <laughs> it's undeniable that you know they have a version off of the colors album but that version is so poppy and it does not have that like rock feel that cheap trick brings to most of their other music so then at Budokan, first of all, you need the last four seconds off of the song that plays before it. Um, was it Ain't That a Shame? Because you need that moment where they just talk to me go and say, I want you to want me. And then go into this real hard rock, hard drive version of that song that like goes on to define what that song is. And, I mean, that album goes on to define their sound. Like, At Budokan is such an important album for Cheap Trick still being a relevant band in 2023. Are they a relevant band in 2023? Am I the only person thinking about Cheap Trick? I mean, their music is used in a bunch of movies, so... We can't I, main I, name I them. But. Venue, I work at a venue where they had cheap trick like three years ago, and it's all anybody can ever talk about is how that what a good show that was. I, I um, I'll be honest, I'm not a huge cheap trick fan. I I, I had a lot of issues, um, uh, mainly because I think I got them confused a lot when we were growing up with better than Ezra, and that's a whole other kettle of fish. <laughs> um, uh, but no, like, cheap I trick get that though. I, I totally understand it. I, uh, I didn't follow, so I, I don't have like a deep like like pull on, on Cheap Trick. Um, but this is one of those instances where it's just like, oh, that's fucking right. They do, yes, yes, that one. And I love that. So, yeah. So, like, I, um, I would probably just, that is probably the version of the song that I am thinking of right now when you say that, right? As somebody that doesn't like have like a deep pull on them, when you say that song, this is the, this is the version that I think of. Um, and like I, I think that in terms of are they relevant today? Yeah, of course. I mean they're as relevant as any other band from the you know from the seventies, eighties. Like like yeah. <laughs> there's there's a fan base for everything, and I'm sure that there's a pretty big fan base still for Cheap Trick because I like I said I I don't hear people all I ever hear is people like talking about what a good show they still put on. I don't know. All I know is I was handed two free Cheap Trick tickets uh, one time when I was at Mohegan Sun, and I'm just like, what does this mean for Cheap Trick? <laughs> What are they big enough or like, do people care about you? But then to go back to the whole Napster stuff, and that's sort of where I settled on this. It was using one of those, you know, pair to pair music sharing things where I downloaded the copy if I want you to want me and then realized that this is a live version, but it's not called that anywhere. It's just cheap trick. I want you to want me. And it was that like view into the psyche of everybody. The people who still think that the Jim Blossoms sang breakfast at Tiffany's instead of deep blue something because Napster said they did where I'm just like, Oh my God, there's a whole other like actual studio recorded album version of this song that nobody's talking about. And then I listen to it and I'm like, I kind of understand why nobody's talking about this. So, yeah. I don't know. This was interesting. I had fun doing it. I have one more, mostly because I I don't want just, like, a seven-song playlist, even though with each of them it would go on to be 14 songs. And that's one of these that I feel has really transcended in popular culture. Do you want to take a guess at what this is? I may have already talked about it last episode, too. I No, what do you... you... Um, Goodnight Saigon by Billy Joel. As much as, like, the Nylon Curtain studio album version is one, I mean, the version that he did off of Concert... I don't know how to pronounce it. It's written in Russian. But the live album that he... Of the performance he did in Russia, uh, in Moscow specifically, of Goodnight Saigon, like... That's transcended popular culture. 
to the fact that, like, in Avenue Q, it's referenced specifically as from the Russia concert in mixtape. <laughs> like, it's one of those things where, yes. I don't know if it happened to you, but, like, talking to people about music, like, th- people would always talk about how that's, like, such a better version of the song. And I'm like, wow, people have a lot of opinions about Billy Joel, don't they? <laughs> Man, excellent. Yeah, I have other covers, but uh, we can I mean, always save it for it another Adam one. Taylor. I have other covers. Here's a sp- about Adam Taylor's multiple covers of uh, of the Hanukkah song. <laughs> <laughs> yep, those are actually readaptations. But I'm telling you here, right? If the Say Report is still a show come this December, I don't know why we wouldn't be, but just to say it, we're going back to this with Christmas covers. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, I um, want to do it because there was one I almost used that might be my favorite cover ever. Yeah, I still get to talk about The Offspring. So yeah. keep going. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, yeah, no, and like, it's, we also live in the era of like the dance remix, right? Like, we didn't really get into that, but like, it's not uncommon nowadays to put out two versions of your song. If you're an artist working, um, like, like self recording nowadays, like, you're always making your version and then you're always making a dance remix version because that's going to be the one that gets played in clubs, right? Like, that's, that's also a whole other level of this that we didn't get into. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, I thought we'd be talking about Planet of the Bass this week, but the full version of that song was disappointing. So, <laughs> as the viral video that, like, showed up in everybody's feed, that one faithful day, Planet of the Bass was awesome. Full song, real interesting study in taking a joke perhaps a bit too far. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll have to talk about that later. Um, I, do you have um, a task for me this week, Seijin? I do. Um, okay. It's on sale this week for seven ninety nine on Google Books. But if um, if you don't want to, you can always just do a preview of it. Um, but I have fallen into uh, a new series that is it's a little throwbacky for me. But I, I am reading "I Hate Fairyland" by Scotty Young. Do you know anything about these books? I know nothing about these books. Okay, there's there's um, there's about twenty different collections out. It's it's it ran up until about 2016, I think. Um, the thing is, like, I don't think it's over because Scotty Young. Um, for anybody that doesn't know, Scotty Young's a, a phenomenal comic book like artist and writer. Um, he's written Deadpool for a long time. He was writing um, Rocket and Groot, which was my favorite. He did an adaptation of um, Wizard of Oz that that. Um, the art on it's some of my favorite art like he's got a very when you see his style he he's got a very like 90s cartoon like look to his his art style um and his writing is interesting deadpool is a really good one to think about before you get into i hate fairyland because it's very much that kind of like over the top violence but it is so cartoony and it is actually not as like it's not gory like like it's not like reading like a garth ennis or, or a warren ellis story right like there's there's a ton of violence but it's very over the top and silly um uh and so i hate fairyland is a series that he goes back to all the time he, he was writing it for for years and he always kind of seems to when he's not doing anything else he seems to pop back into just writing a couple of more books for i hate fairyland um so the first book, like I said, is on sale on Google Books for like seven ninety nine right now. Um, and if you can buy that, or you can just look at a preview of it. Um, and it's just about a young girl that uh, finds herself in an Alice in Wonderland situation, but things are not as great for her as they were for Alice. And things weren't that great for Alice, if you've ever yeah, read the yeah, novel. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Excited. I like this. I like the whole literature thing. For me... It's a mystery review. Seijin, I'm going to send out. You're going to receive something in the mail this week, and then we're going to talk about it on the show. Okay. So these don't have to be assignments that everybody can do. They can be assignments that just you and I can do. Well, everybody can do that. I think the... Well, I mean, the people should be sticking along and stuff like that. I mean, I, I guess I could tell people what it is if they want to go out. This is expensive. Like, this is an expensive thing that I'm going to send out to you. Uh, not like hyper expensive, not like prohibitively expensive, but I am curious to hear your take on it. The nature of you not saying what it is, like it's not people can't go out and review a thing if you don't tell them what it is. Right, right, right. So I'm getting it up and making sure. I don't even know. It's like it's a crazy thing that happened, and it's it's gonna. Inter- I think there's gonna be good conversation about it. 
it is it's still available. Before it's still available. Reveal. So okay, what you you're going what it is, yeah. Hold on. Before you reveal what it is, for the record, I'm not saying we have to do this. If you want to keep this a secret, we can keep this a secret before we before okay. we break the mystery seal. I I do want to keep it a secret. I want it to be a secret where you get it and then you you see what it is and then you got to go from okay. there. So all right, everybody. Yeah. Well, keep an eye on the keep, keep an eye on the, the uh, if you want to know what it is and review it yourself first before you listen. Keep an eye on the uh, description for next week's episode. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty good idea. We'll make sure that it's in there, um, or maybe like video pictures from Seijun will go up on one of our sites or things like that. Um, like like we're gonna have the playlist of all those songs that are available on Spotify. I gotta go put that together when we're done here so that you can listen and, and hear a little bit. Um, but also, if you have favorite covers by the original artists that you want to share with us. Uh, you can always send those to us via email at the say report at gmail.com. Like that's, that's the thing you can do. And mm-hmm. other, like other thoughts about all the YouTube controversy. We'd like to hear from it there too. Like if you listen, like we'd like to hear from you. Like let's, let's have a dialogue listeners. <laughs> the say report at gmail.com. Anything else that you want to add Seijin or are you good this week? No, man, I'm I'm good. Um, I I was mad that we didn't get to talk. Uh, someday we will get to talk about uh, Tia Carrera. Um, it, just in the music conversations that we were having, um, because she is uh really big in a in a film series that Devin dove into this week. But also, she had a really great music career, oh. including doing a phenomenal cover of Ballroom Blitz that I love. Um, but she did not do the original version of Ballroom Blitz, so I couldn't use her for my cover for this week. Wow. I mean, Seijin, you want to talk about the stuff I did this week? It all felt like, man, I'm gonna have nothing to talk about. <laughs> like, ah, uh, so we'll we'll have some fun with it. Yeah. So, mystery review from Seijin, uh, talking about Hate and Fairyland from Scott Young next week. Uh, but until then, Will, why don't you bring us home? Thanks for stopping by, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Say Report with your host Devin Decker and Seijin Serwick. Please follow the guys on Twitter and Facebook by searching for The Say Report. And you can always subscribe on your podcast channel so this is delivered straight to you and you can enjoy it every week. With apologies to your mother, we'll see you next time.